All right, we'll go ahead and call our August 24, 2022 policy meeting to order. Um, any changes to the draft minutes from April or May 18th? No changes to All approved? Yes. All right. Public comment is next. Um, I know some of you would like to listen to our discussion on the anti-racism policy, so I will let you reserve your public comment for after that discussion or now. If you have to leave, you can give your public comment now and leave. Um, if you'd like to stay and give your public comment afterwards, then we can reserve that way. That's a little adjustment. I hope everybody's okay with it. Um, I have William Mahone, Monica, Brown, Reed, and Leslie Sturbs. Would anybody like to go now? Or would you like to wait for after our discussion? Public comment. Uh, we welcome public comment. I don't have the official statement. Um, and it's not a question and answer session. You have three minutes if you are speaking as an individual, five minutes if you are speaking for an organization. You know, my name is Leslie Skirms, and I'm speaking for myself today. I felt it was necessary to come down and address the, uh, address the committee because I feel that the anti-racism policy is so important. In particular, I'd like to address two sections of the, uh, of the brief. Um, I, I believe it's really important to have inclusivity in terms of racial balance in the in the city and in the public schools and i think it's really important that we tell the truth when it comes to our diverse country and the um I'm a little nervous sorry when it comes to our diverse con country and it's, it's complicated history i believe when we don't tell the truth when we exclude things and we leave out things that might be painful for us, it's a disservice to everyone. And I think promoting inclusivity in staff and teachers and um, having the truth told during our classes will lead to the other things that are, are outlined in this, namely understanding, anti-bullying, more respect for others, and more respect for the community. And I think that's all to the good. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have signed up for public comment. You wanna go now or later? Uh, I'll go at this one. Okay. Thank you, I'm Willie Mahone. I'm appearing as a private citizen, a concerned citizen. Uh, to comment on the anti-racism policy. Uh, I reviewed that policy and uh, some comments about that policy. I would first say is looking at the policy on the first page on the purpose, it states that uh, racism all form, in all forms is the front to the mission and goals for FCTS, the Board of Education. A uh, Frederick County seeks to prevent and stop racism at FCPS. I would change the word stop to eradicate, uh, not to stop, not to simply prevent and stop, but to prevent and re eradicate any all racism at FCPS. Eradicate speaks to the very real possibility that it, it exists, has existed, and we want to eradicate. Going down on the policy, uh, it says uh, this policy is intended to ensure the following. Uh, go down to number four. It says education out outcomes shall not be predictable by actual perceived personal characteristics and gaps in student achievement will be significantly reduced. It should say gaps in, in student achievement will be eliminated. As a matter of fact, the name of the policy is addressing and eliminate. So I would remove, remove uh, uh, reduce to eliminate. And the last bullet point at the penultimate sentence says education that promote understanding, I will put in achievement, understanding and diversity. I think it's important to put achievement there. On the next page, um, the 
On the culture, uh, the second bullet point talks about periodic uh, annual communication with parents and students. I would substitute periodic communication with parents and students. You know, depending upon what's going on, uh, would dictate you know whether or not it needs to be uh, communicated more than that. Uh, the fourth bullet, the last bullet, there talks about uh, uh, the board director superintendent to gather data on student and staff perception for school based calls. I have some concern about that. When you start getting staff perception, uh, those staff are employed by the Board of Education. So you may want to put some kind of anonymity provision in there. I've spoken over the years to African American teachers who articulated things to myself that they wouldn't articulate to the Board of Education or their employer. So I think that you want to put an anonymity provision there. I think I'm pretty much, I have another comment. And that comment uh, goes to the training, Hiring and training. In hiring and training, what is missing? Well, one thing about this, we have a policy, and I'm not sure that the policy is articulation of a principle or value, or it is the articulation of a principle in conjunction with implementation. Now, this seems to be that hybrid. I see some articulation of a principle, and I see some implementation. When you start talking about implementation, I think it's wanting in that in that regard. And I think that our chairperson, NWCP chairperson, would speak to that. When you start talking about hiring, give me 30 seconds, please. What we need, what we need, folks, is uh, I have data, and I had it, and I, I talked about it, that shows that minority teachers are applying, but they are not being hired. I have data going back to this school system data that provides me, 2015. For instance, in 2016, uh, I think 0.068 percentage of the black teachers applicants were hired, whereas 0.16 percentage of the Caucasian teachers were hired. Uh, I think in 2017, I think it was 0.02, three times as many uh, non-minority teachers were hired as uh, non-minority applicants were hired as minority applicants. It bespeaks that in that process, from the uh, applicant to the interview to the teacher selection, that process, the minority teachers are weeded out. What we're doing, we're talking about recruitment, and I would just say, call Shelly Coletta, or Shelly Collette name may have changed. She was here a long time ago. We worked on these issues. They did recruitment. They went to HBCU. If you apply, and you do not get selected, and you are a, a college student, graduating college student, right? And you apply for, for Frederick County as a minority, you don't get selected. You tell your roommate, who is a junior, who's gonna be applying next year, don't bother to go there because they aren't gonna hire you. We need to look at the selection process vis-a-vis -vis in regard to minority applicants from beginning to end. We have the data, you can redact uh, the, information that would show who they are and look at the applicant and see where the minority applicants were weeded out. That's simple, folks. 1999, we had a group called Parents Association of African American Students. We raised this issue. We looked at this issue, went through it, and what we found, finish up. yes, please. What we found is that the minority teachers, applicants were being uh, weeded out at the final stages. We need to look at the stages. We have tried all these things we did. We've done recruitment and all. What we need to do is look at where they're weeded out and stop making excuses for animus, uh, a race of animus that exists somewhere. Stop making excuses for it. First we do truth, and then we do reconciliation. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Monica Brown Reed, and I'm the NAACP Education Co Chair. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, this committee for allowing us to provide feedback, and especially Ms. Barrett for giving us the revised policy, and also to Mr. Bass for keeping us surprised along the way. We still know that the policy was posted late to the board docs 
uh, website for it. And we're concerned because that really doesn't give community partners a chance to look at the policy and to provide meaningful feedback. We are pleased with the fact that the policy now addresses some of those priority areas that we feel are important, specifically dealing with racism, particularly um, implementing the multicultural and diverse curriculum. So we're happy to see that in here. As far as beginning to address, as Mr. Mahoney said, issues of hiring and retaining minority <clears throat> staff. In general, the policy, we really don't understand whether or not this is just a policy. Should it be more than just a policy? Should it cite a position? We don't see information in the policy that addresses what actions will be taken, if any, and how will it be enforced? We also wonder what well, board of education members that don't embrace this policy, what will you do? How will you handle any board of ed member that violates the policy? In general, again, um, we don't know how to move forward. Let me just back up. We know how to move forward, but I know this isn't a question and answer period, but I just want to go through the policy and highlight some of the things that we're concerned about. The first one is under the attention, collaboration, and action section, where it talks about being empowered in the workplace and, and working swiftly and actively. Uh, the question is, well, how will you address those swiftly and assertively? Outside of a reporting form, what action will you take? And how, again, will you enforce it? Moving on through the policy in bullet number four, you state that after an incident, responses and resources are going to be shared with the entire school community in a manner that preserves the student and staff privacy. And we understand those issues are, are important, but what we don't know is, and we've heard a lot, as well as you have heard a lot from the community, a lot of these incidents, we hear about them, but then they go into what I'll call a black hole. We don't know what happened. Um, so that leaves the community feeling numb. So how long will it take for you to report an incident? And how will all staff, students, and community partners be informed? Are they going to be collated and reported quarterly with the Racial Equity Committee with the online public forum or twice yearly with the BOE? That's, that's an option. Um, as far as culture, number five bullet. The board directs the superintendent to gather data on student and staff perceptions, and I won't read the whole thing, and to collect this information twice yearly for the BOE. But how will the community partners and other stakeholders in the community receive that feedback? We also have that same comment as you move on in the policy under the student access and achievement under board number two. Again, how will community partners provide feedback and comments? Uh, with regard to the curriculum under bullet number two, it says that curriculum and instructional materials for all grades will reflect cultural and racial diversity. But how are you going to achieve this? Will multicultural curriculum specialists be hired? Will you have a timeline and a benchmark for when you want this to be completed? Um, and moving on to bullet number three, who's going to examine these curriculum materials? Uh, will they be individuals that are within Frederick County Public School System, or are they going to be outside? We're concerned about having someone who is, is knowledgeable of this very broad and difficult arena to address, that you have the correct people, and that you don't necessarily use those people with inside the school. But if you do, that you definitely have someone on the outside collaborating and working alongside the unit within FC. And our last uh, two comments deal with uh, hiring and training. We talk about in bullet number one that you're going to use employee associations. We don't really know who those are. We, we're familiar with employee organizations, associations, but we don't know who you're referring to. Are these some new associations? And then the last comment under bullet number four, we talk about these data again, where you're going to use culture and student access and achievement to report quarterly 
well, again, how will the community be able to provide feedback on that? And again, will you have timelines and benchmarks to look at when you want to have this parity with teacher hiring resembling the student population? So we thank you for, for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Next up, we have our House 109. Nope, sorry. Anybody else like to give public comments or inside? Please state your name. Okay. You want to go at the end? Bring her up here. Yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Tia Dow Bell, and I'm a member of the Racial Equity Committee. Um, so I'm just going to give some quick comments. First of all, I want to say that this policy has come a long way um, since the April 27th meeting. So thank you so so much. Ms. Garrett for all of your work on this. Um, it looks it looks really um, a lot more comprehensive at this point. Um, so just want to thank everyone um, on the Board of Education for the opportunity to provide feedback on the revised anti-racism draft policy. Um, on behalf of the Racial Equity Committee, we appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into this draft, revised uh, draft and um, appreciate that it includes concrete expectations across domains, including attention, collaboration and action, culture, student access and achievement, curriculum, staff hiring and training, and transparency and reporting. We are especially pleased to see the plan built in to ensure that data in all these areas are collected on a regular basis reported on a quarterly basis and will be addressed at least twice quarterly. I'm sorry, twice a year with the Board of Education. This is necessary so that FCPS can evaluate its efforts in order to build an anti-racist environment. We often hear from community members that they are tired of having conversations about how to address racism at FCPS with no action to follow and no and no meaningful change. And this policy is the first step to providing an infrastructure to hold ourselves accountable and assess progress. Anti-racism is not just the absence of racism, but also it promotes racial equity. The sentiment of being anti-racist is reflected throughout the body of the policy, but it is not included in the title. Words have a lot of power. So including it in the title and providing a definition of racism to go alongside a, a definition of anti-racism to go alongside the definition of racism will be a bold declaration of what this policy entails and what it stands for. <clears throat> Thank you for again for this opportunity to provide comment on the revised draft. We look forward to working with the Board of Education, superintendent, school leadership and staff, parents, students and the larger Frederick community to ensure that this policy is operationalized as intended and that our vision of racial equity throughout FCPS is realized. The work is just beginning and we look forward to being a partner in this. Um, I will just ask, if at all possible, I heard a lot of comments about implementation and enforcement, um, and I don't know if we are all aware of what policy at the board level does versus how policy is implemented. So if there is an opportunity to comment on that um, from, the, from the board, that would be most appreciated and um, maybe even comment on whether or not enforcement is included as part of implementation or whether that's generally included as part of the policy. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're gonna Changes to policy 109 are being presented today the policy committee as a result of um, the state ethics commission sharing with us um, that there were some changes at the state level um, and so oftentimes this is your only policy that has this additional oversight from the state ethics commission and so when something changes at the state official level we'll typically get a letter so this was triggered by a letter that we received from the chair saying as you're aware, boards of education are required to adopt local ethics laws and ordinances that include conflict of interest 
and financial disclosure provisions from members of the school board that are at least equivalent to state provision. So when something's happening at that state legislature, then they'll review our policy, give us feedback, and review it. So again, this is kind of unique. So these changes were made to do a crosswalk with the state law, then the state ethics chair will review those, indicate that we're complying, and then we bring it here and start it through our process. So again, this is um, one of your unique policies that has that little extra provision in the law. So the changes that you see, and they're really focused on the elected official of the board and the elected official that they're concurrent. So you'll see some lobbying restrictions when you leave office relative to representing. A lot of those things typically don't fall um, to an elected board member, but if they do, they want to make sure that they, they're parallel. So I just wanted to kind of walk you through those changes, but I wanted to give you the why, um, the why behind. And this was outlined in two house bills, 363 and 1058. And then again, like this letter went out to each board of education and it came in um, to the superintendent. And we have letters from the union. When Dr. Marker was the um, interim superintendent, so came in March 22nd, 2022. So, are there areas of our current policy, whether or not we be excited or like materially, like I, I see a red change here, mm -hmm. that were materially uh, less sufficient than the, uh, um, or not equal to the, this, the most. No, because actually they in, in Comar they show you a model policy of what you have to include. So if you see them, you know, now the board can add additional ones. So we have, you know, areas that might not be in there because the board or the ethics policy recommended it based on local preference. But as far as what's in the state model, it it, it parallels. So the wording in red the state ethics as a result of state law. They said now you gotta update this and you gotta indicate this you know language in there. And two, a lot of the focus is on when somebody runs for candidacy. So you see some changes um so that they're aware when they run for candidacy there's some changes in there as far as um reporting and not having that go in. So this is a reg that's really written for current board members and then people that are you know filing for candidacy for them. Did the state board give a timeline for well, it's, they're effective now. So this, these are effective currently, these changes. We're just trying to stamp <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, it, I mean, like, we so that's the change. weird dynamic. Yeah, we can't make changes to them. So. No. But um, effect, would, you, would we say these are effective now uh, if we pass these, or would we say these are effective as of March when we receive a letter from the state? So typically, they're effective when the board finally adopts them, but you're still held to that standard. But I don't think any of the five, because you haven't filled out your disclosure statements yet. And like I said, for candidacies, you know, they'll do that. So what typically happens is they'll say, these changes went into a pack. We're, we're giving you notification, and now they know the next step is here. And so these, Will fall into then now we need year from your annual financial disclosure statements. So they're saying that next round is when this applies. So what we'll do, um, Mr. Bass, is when these changes happen, there's a corresponding change then in your financial disclosure statement. So because you filed this annually, that's why we're, this is timely. That's why we wanted to get this scheduled now before we ask you to do your annual financial disclosure statement. So you'll see that there's new terms, um, new areas like second home. You know, defining second home if you have more than one home, what does that mean? Um, if you have any uh, employment relationship with the University of Maryland system. Those are going to be now new areas that will crosswalk and you'll see on your annual financial disclosure statement.
So because because we received the, the notification to the in March, I believe candidates for the school board filled out their financial statement filed. Mm -hmm. So is that they filled out probably from last year to last year by the Yeah. So is that yeah? Or do yeah. we need to go back? You know, and, and you know, the Board of Elections Office too will <laughs> indicate if there's additional information they need, so they kind of work in concert with our office because typically a candidate that goes there before they come here. But they get the, mm -hmm. but they get the financial disclosure package. What I'm saying though is that a candidate filed in February that they have gotten which I would they would have gotten the previous one, not with the changes in it yet. And so typically when something happens relative to this, so once we approve these changes to the board, then I'll go back to the board elections office and say, are they substantially the same? Do we want to file an amendment? So that would be my next step after we do that. There's usually a little bit of grace period for that. Any questions? So I would recommend, just because of the time sensitivity um, on this, if we could maybe go ahead and schedule it for a work session at the next um, board meeting in September, and that way we can finalize it, and then I can correspond back with the Board of Elections and the State Ethics Commission. I'm comfortable with that time frame. Is there any other reason besides the time frame? Yeah, and I'm sorry. Is there any other reason besides the Um, yeah. So we, we needed time for the state ethics commission to review and he would back off because he had to do it for all twenty four counties. So we submitted it and then he said, Hey, I'm busier than I have have ever been, but I'll get back with you. So he got back with us and so that was because he had all twenty four. Thank you. 1.05 policy 427 So um, in June, there was a pretty significant Supreme Court decision as it relates to the free exercise clause and the establishment clause of the First Amendment. And so we have reviewed that decision. We've met um, as attorneys, we've received um, information from the National School Board Association. We received, um, we, we really got some great advice from the Maryland Boards of Education to say, what does this decision mean? How does it impact our policy? What are still unanswered questions? Um, and I said, I think, I think Ms. Barrett, you know, she said, hey, you know, Junior, if you want it, stand it, should we bring this policy for discussion? Because we've also done some training um, on this this summer to, to determine what is what does the decision mean um, and what is clear? Uh, and then what are some things I think have to be interpreted? So what is clear? I just gave you a little summary. Um, you know, this was a coach who in quiet private prayer on the 50 yard line after a game on what they deemed as private time could, you know, bow at the 50 yard line and say a quiet prayer. Um, and they said it would be unconstitutional. He could be against his free exercise rights to not allow him to do that. The school system said, but he's in our uniform, he is still supervising students, he's out in the middle of the field, this feels like he's establishing religion. So you have the free exercise, I have the right to free exercise of my religious beliefs on my private time, but if I'm working for the school system, I can't establish religion, I can't pray with students. So this was a 6-3 decision that really overturned 20 years of what we call the lemon test. You know, does this look like I'm endorsing religion with my students? So this certainly has gotten a lot of review and a lot of discussion. And so where the advice from NSBA and as we come together as attorneys, and I was just like to pull out the language of the court. What's the Supreme Court telling you? Supreme Court said this was based on the unique and narrow facts of um, it was quiet prayer, it was not with students, and it was during his private time. And they discussed, described why it was private time because although it was after the game, he was walking to the bus, he was still technically on duty, that if you have these moments of 
time to, I'm texting my husband, I'm going to go to him, he did great for me. So if I have a little minute, what's called the in-between time, right? Um, the kids were on the way to the bus, they're singing the, um, the, the victory song, not with kids, and I had the right to do some personal, and they used that as I could text them saying when I'm coming home, then if that's that little piece of private time, it was 15 seconds, then you can't say, well, you can let your spouse know you're on the way home by Valley Don't Pray. So they said you can't show hostility towards religion. You can't say you can do these private things because in that moment, in those 15 seconds, it was private speech. It wasn't speech of the school system. Now, that certainly can be debatable because, again, he was out in the open. So what the school system said is you, you can do that, but we think if you're doing it in our uniform out in the middle of the field, it does feel like you're endorsing religion with your players. Supreme Court said no. It was a brief, quiet moment, not with the students. So that's what we know relative to the decision. So we already have um, a, a, seg a segment in this policy that says when you're officially on duty, you know, you can't engage in religious activity with students. Um, so I have provided little edits to this because I think um, we already have something that captures what the Supreme Court said. But in the first sentence, I just thought, I think it, it is important to say we uphold the free exercise and the establishment clause because they made a very strong point to say school system, you got to make sure you're looking at both. Um, establishing religion, but in these moments, I have a right to, to quietly pray if I'm not with students. So that's why this made the change to the policy statement because I think that was a very strong point of the Supreme Court. So do you have any questions on that edit? And I, I think I think you've explained the Supreme Court's actions well. In terms of inserting, could we make the case that the free exercise clause could have or should have been in the policy from the get-go? Like, does the Supreme Court's decision change? Could we reflect on the way the policy was written? Should free exercise have been in there? Uh, prior to the Supreme Court case? Yeah, that's a great question, David. So in 20, and that's what you're saying, the decision, this over 20 years, it was 20 years of case law and advice from Department of Ed and Department of Justice, I said, you have a policy make sure you're not establishing religion, okay? So they were really focusing on the establishment clause. This decision said that you can't forget about the free exercise. Typically how we handle the free exercise is when employees ask for a reasonable accommodation for religious reasons. We have to reasonably accommodate them. So we've always handled that kind of in that thou shalt not discriminate based on someone's religion. So we've done that more practically um, from an employment standpoint when they ask for an excusal or an absence or a leave. We have to um, reasonably accommodate that. This is saying no school systems. Now you can say that there could be those examples when I'm in my official capacity, I might have these private moments. Where I do have the right to free exercise. But sometimes teachers will say, Can we pray before the school day? Um, you know, together for our nation. After 9 11, we saw that. During COVID, we saw that. Um, and we'd say, You know, if that's your private time before school begins and your day begins, and you would be in the lounge doing personal things, you can't say you can't do that. You can't force other people to do it. So I would say, in practice, we've had that to accommodate. But I think this decision now has said the school systems go back and make sure you're not just looking at the establishment clause, but also the free exercise. So I can see why we didn't incorporate it before, but I can definitely see why it's important to share both. And when we do training, certainly we focus on both. And I have a follow-up question there. Some of your clarifications on why the Supreme Court said this particular prayer was okay, was uh, brief, and a moment not directly with students. And quiet. It wasn't praying out loud. Yeah, okay. Quiet. Actually, I do have that note. Brief, yeah. quiet, and a moment not with students. Do any of those characteristics need to make it into our written policy? Um, I think that's, you know, a question. You know, we can talk about um, and when we get to the other page, I really struggled to put stuff in and I took it out. What does it mean to be officially on duty? 
you're not officially on duty if you have this private moment where you can do personal things. So in the next page is probably where I thought we would have some dialogue about maybe having that be because I'll tell you I struggled with do I know what this means? Could I know how to interpret this? Because I think there's still a lot of gray um, and things yet to be interpreted. Because what they said is he was responsible for supervising the kids, but he still had this brief moment walking to the bus. And so is that kind of that in between time? If I could do other personal things, I'm still on duty, but what does it mean to not be officially on duty? And that is where I think we struggle in the interpretation. So on the, the second page where we talk about um, the official neutrality school employees when you're acting in your official capacity, um, you can't actively participate with students, um, you know, of a religious nature. And so could we look at that to say, but you're not officially on duty if you have this duty to commit private. But the, the decision was clear, you can't actively do it with students. You can't have a captive audience with students. And they even talked about when he was on the field and students would join him. They said this isn't that. Um, because then parents, you know, gave testimony about well, would my child who doesn't believe what you believe do it anyway to get more playing time? And so they teased that out to say that because there was a continuum. First the coach did private prayer and religious talks in the locker room, and then he would do prayers after the game and the players would join him. Um, and the school system said that it is a violation of the establishment clause, and the court agreed with that. But so, if the coach, if the coach, sorry to interrupt your question, I mean, these scenarios are ever, mm -hmm. these are, this is the, because this is the, when we talk about having a policy versus the instructions you give the staff, I mean, duty time is going to be a huge issue, right? I mean, Everybody gets to you know, take five minutes, you know, go get a drink of water, yeah. drink, and drink. That's personal. Yeah. And you can certainly you know, pray silent for two hours. Well, now you're done walk for you. Yeah, I mean, and that's, but if we're talking about a coach, so if this is where I, because I read those important papers several times, so I think I was kind of defensive. I guess we could use the property as the coach goes to the middle of the field. So the school property is the school of that. The coach is right school color. The coach, there's no doubt the coach is on duty as a coach because he has to get the kids off the bus and line the jet out the right way. So they are still his responsibility. So if he um, kneels in private prayer, whatever private prayer means exactly right. Um, and then other students come within five feet or ten feet and also be in prayer. Mm -hmm. Are they joining him? Mm -hmm. Are they influenced? Because you know students have always had the right to do that. Yeah, it's been the establishment. Well, silently next to him. I mean, I know. This so these are the, you know, I mean, the, yeah, you're, never, this out. you're hitting on the, the questions because it says what the coach, you know, what we know is it was brief, quiet during personal time, not with students. Questions yet to be answered. What's official duty day? What will happen to students much more voluntarily? Um, what if it would be, you know, younger students with the same rule apply? Um, and what was shared is the majority was convinced, the majority of the court was convinced that both substance and circumstances of his prayer showed that they did not take place in the scope of his duties as a coach. They're not in the scope of his coaching duties. Um, and they were offered when students were otherwise engaged. So that tells me otherwise engaged is not they're hanging out on the field with you. So right now what I would say to a coach is I'm taking the word from the case to say this is your brief private time, but as soon as students come in, I think that's vulnerable for unconscious. 
that's it based on this decision, how I'm reading this. Right. Okay. So if students are taking a test and they all are bent down in room eight, yeah. and the test is going to take a whole high school block, how are they taking it? Yeah. And the teacher has you know, their own time. They're obviously looking around the student, but that is time to perhaps create papers or you know, text their spouse back or whatever. The students are otherwise engaged, just like they would be if they were walking to the bus, right? But they're still under that student's care. Can the teacher then kneel in the classroom and have a silent prayer? Not according to the decision, because the decision said what current, what what is not, what remains unchanged is the captive audience. Students are a captive audience in a classroom, in a locker room, because those were prior decisions of the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court did say, now, this is our decision, this is a little narrowly comparable decision, but it doesn't overturn past law, which says when you have a captive audience with your students, it would be violating the establishment clause. So, and, and they're on the same captive audience that is otherwise. Yes. <laughs> well, thank so, you for reading the 25-page decision with me. So the athletes get in their car or get in their parents' car, they're the supervision. And playing so loosely with it. The same. Well, there are private women on the field. Like, I, I was lucky. My coach was in the locker room in college. We didn't do it in high school. So we went to the locker room. Mm -hmm. and, uh, coach said a prayer or one player said a prayer. And, you can participate if you want, you can kneel if you want, or you would go to your locker and sit and get your fingers your beautiful. But it was in the locker room. Like, nobody could see. You right. know, and, and it, it, they're playing loosely with that. Well, not this thing like this. Because was a, when you're on the field as a coach, your kids, are, your athletes are still watching you. If they're, whether they're over shaking hands with the other team, they're still part of the team on the field. And, that, that is so loose with, with well i'm sure you, this was a seven-year practice so the seven-year practice was this coach in the locker room and training with students um and it was only that the school system became aware when the superintendent of the coaching team called the superintendent and said hey i really want to commend you you know we saw this practice on the field and they were like what and and so <laughs> <laughs> you know what <laughs> and um and, and to this point you know um and, 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 and like I said, this is during now for a couple of years. Now, one thing Maven and SBA said is the first thing you do is look at your job description. And we do say when you're a coach, your official duty begins and ends. You're always with the student and you have to supervise the student. This coach was reprimanded for not supervising kids during private moments. So there's a lot, you know, journeying on when you look at all the, the background information. And so our, ours do say your official duty day is you always are supervising your kids from beginning to end. So I think we can certainly know that we know the official duty days. But I think we can't ignore that if we have these moments like Ms. Barrett referred to, um, you know, in my in-between time, if my class is in between, and I do have a moment, my duty-free lunch, that's easy. My free exercise clause, I can pray at lunch and go read the Bible. Um, so I'm not with kids, so they're going to have to the audience. And you know, when my students are changing classes and I don't have that responsibility, I think that is my private time that they're referencing here. Um, is that captive audience when you're with students, I think, gives us that bright line test. But I think we're going to see some other cases come up as a result of this. And two, um, this is all religion, okay? Not just yeah. Christian religion. And so, um, this will also, you know, we have to be very mindful that this is an open perspective, but that's why, too, I think constitutional attorneys are saying we're going to see some other cases tease this out, tease this interpretation. But the, you know, the advice I'm giving right now is I want to focus on the fact pattern of this case. And if you have these private, quiet moments where you can text your husband or text your spouse, that's what they capture as you're not in your official duties in that moment, um, and we can't say you can do everything but pray. That's what this says. And as far as in the locker room, in the classroom, I can easily answer that because the court told me. We didn't touch that. We didn't touch that. 
fire can't have this kind of text and work. Do you still have to leave at 11? But I, 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 we could sit here and talk religion all day. But I, I don't, you know, it's so confusing <laughs> to me. I, I don't have to know what. Okay. You know, this the quiet and private because to me, there's no more public than a fifty yard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the, it's private because he stole it. When they referenced private speech, the school system in that moment did not own his speech. So when I'm teaching, that's government speech, right? But so the private was not necessarily referencing a private prayer, but in that moment, he was speaking as a private citizen, not a state actor. So, yeah, there are lots of different ways to pray. They express their faith. So, what if somebody's prayer is less quiet? What if they rolls out a prayer that coaching is I would say I think that Risky because this decision talked about the brevity, the quietness, and the person. So I'd say I don't know. I mean, you can't you can't promote some kind of prayer. No. Yeah. Well, you probably saw that in the dissent. That's what they said. We appreciate where you got there, but we're confused about everything else. Um, so I think those are questions yet to be answered. And the only thing we could add to 427.3, because we talk about when you're in your official capacity, you can't do this. We could pull in some language from this decision that says the free exercise clause does protect employees when they are not on official you know, not you know, in your official capacity to have moments of quiet private prayer, provided you're not, you know, with students. So that was what I was teasing back and forth. That do you, does the committee feel like we need to have something like that to show a parallel to 427.3? So that's why I wrote it. I took it out and I thought, well, let's just talk about it and you can give me some advice. Your question is whether to keep in the language of from encouraging or discouraging religious activity? No, so 427.3, so that was the test that was coming out when they said the lemon test no longer applies here. So that was language from the test. What I would say is under 427, it says when you're in the official capacity, you can't establish religion, you can't pray with kids. Do we also want to say, but your rights under the free exercise clause will allow you in your private time um, to engage in and then set some standard free quiet prayer during your personal time during your work day but not with students. But if we don't if we don't describe if we don't describe what we find is and what personal time is. Well we could is personal time in the contract for example. Yeah and if personal so if you're so if you if you work if you work all day outside the school system and then you come in in the afternoon and you need to coach. Yeah. So you're not you're not under the school system. I'm, I'm probably wrong about this, but so you're not under like the duty time, you know, negotiated agreement, but you have a contract with your coach. Yeah. And so I don't believe are you part of the bargaining unit as a, as a part time coach? Yeah. So then we would have a contract that would not define duty time, or would not define personal time. It would say, this is your job. You get kids on and off the bus, you coach them, you're a great role model, you know, you just treat them you know, so, so what do we do with that? Because that's different. Like we're talking about this Supreme Court decision is so focused on uh, that not captive audience, and you know, it almost seems like how it works is really, I mean, it's such a narrow, yeah. You know, and here's how they define the, the personal time, and this is what I toyed with. Um, when school officials are allowed to attend private matters, that's what they say. You're here to official work at, but if you have these spots of time where it's time where you are allowed to attend to private matters, such as personal phone calls, text the family, um, that 
have to have that idea. Pardon? Yeah, how does, what, what if you have for that? I did that. Oh, yeah. Can we address that? Yeah, because yeah. 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 we say, you know, when you step on school premises, you know, you got lunch duty, bus duty. Things like that, except for lunchtime. They're not giving you lunchtime. Yeah. But but a part time coach doesn't count. No. Not unless they're also a teacher with us, but the coaching contract, you know, basically says your official duty day is when you're always with kids. And then some coaches come from other schools to live out this school. You know what I mean? Like it's not so I think that which I think is important to work. While they're coaching, I mean the time they show up. All the kids leave. They're a coach. They are an SCTS employee and they should be following mm -hmm. guidelines that, that we've set out for, even if you're a part time coach, mm -hmm. if you work on a five time coach, mm -hmm. you know, you're still under contract with us as a coach. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, you're a state actor. I mean, when yeah. you're working for us, you're a, yeah. you fall under the First Amendment. Right. So, so if, uh, if a coach, let's, let's take prayer out. Let's take prayer off. Coach finishes the, the soccer game and the next member of the team. Yeah, they're probably the assistant coaches, probably an administrator, probably. Um, and the coach then, I mean, I wouldn't even. I don't know how long, how long was the prayer? 15 seconds. 15 seconds. I mean. To me, you're a coach until every player leaves. And even if you drive one home, you're still a coach. Absolutely. I, but I mean, 15 seconds to go, you know, what if you walked over to the stands and, you know, uh, you hadn't seen your, your cousin in a week and you slapped him five for 15 seconds? I mean, like, that seems, I'm just confused about the, the management of time that we seem to be responsible for and what personal time is. Because to me, that's just what those things come out with challenges and questions. Because yeah. I'm an employee, I wouldn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know what to do if I needed to pray or I wanted to pray or I felt the friend, and then students came and were near me through it, right? As well, mm -hmm. 40 yard wide, or 50 yard wide. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's lots of pictures that show of what we had, we did this three times, and that's exactly what happened. Players from both sides created the circle, much like when we had the picture taken in one of our schools. That's you know what happened. Well, that's ingrained in my brain right now. So, <laughs> and, and that's why, too, I think we want to make sure what we know what the board's direction is through this policy. And so right now I'm taking a very conservative approach that if we want to give details about the free exercise clause and what the direction we want to give to tie it in directly to the words of the decision. Um, because it's yet to be seen how that will be teased, debated, or interpreted. So I don't even know how they're telling me to interpret it right now. And um, and this is an area, you know, certainly we're going to be meeting with athletic directors. Um, social studies teachers have me meet with them over the summer just to understand the decision from an instructional standpoint. Um, and, and it's a great First Amendment analysis, but now Kevin Kendra's side of the house is, what advice do we give our coaches? And I said, well, we're going to be talking about this. Here's how I'm looking at the decision. So it will be something that, you know, it would be an important interpretation for our policy to give advice. So it's still a little too late. Don't do anything except for three years. I agree. Uh, so, what's I mean, that just opens up for a teacher to be in class. You know, I, I assigned them work to do, and I had a little bit of time, so I texted my own. You was so yeah. that would, what we would say is not in the presence of students. So you might have that personal time to do that. It's personal time to do other activities, not in the presence of students. You're so, in the presence of athletes. So. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> and how it was present. Well, I'm comparing we the two. Far away, 100 yards away. I think that's, this will be an exciting area to see. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
So do you, do you feel like you want me to maybe pull in some language, insert it, and come up and, and, and talk about it some more before we take it to the work session? We're talking about pulling some language from the, the so court case uh -huh. regarding free exercise clause? Yes, to 427.3, and then maybe we'll come back and talk about it. Because like Liz said, if you read this decision and the complexity, and in the, if you like I said, you'll see that, that they've raised more questions than the provided answers. But I can extrapolate what I know for sure and what they're in fact about. And anything I think we, we, we write in policy, I think that, that that would be my recommendation to make sure we take care of it. Yeah, I don't really want to, I mean, not to sign in that effort, but I don't really want to read regulation of custody. We need to be solving this issue, not with problems we can solve this by better defining duty time and personal time yeah. outside of this. Because if we did that, then people would know when when they're when they're on and when they're off. And I think um, that to me is a better solution. Okay. Well and hopefully what will happen in the meantime, see the Department of Justice and the Department of Ed, anytime there's a big decision on religion in schools, they modify the guidelines. So I asked Faye to kind of watch that for me because then they'll say, here's what this means for school system personnel. So they, a lot of what's in your policy is based on those two organizations coming together to get advice based on the Supreme Court. So that's another thing I'm, I'm watching and waiting for, but I think it'll be helpful. All right, so I will work on this and then we'll have some additional discussion at our next policy committee. Thank you. Thank you very much for the input and the discussion. It was really helpful. Yeah. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. All right, 1.06 draft policy 117 in the camera. This is an updated discussion. Um, so, to touch on what was uh, talked about in the public comments, we have drafted a policy. We're going to discuss the policy, and using our policies do not get into um, the types of discipline or um, items that are covered in our regulations. Regulations are determined by the superintendent, and that will discuss further um, implementation, uh, resources, curriculum. Um, you know, we have our discipline policy or yeah, our discipline regulation. So, you know, if this would create a situation where we need different guidelines in our regs, then the superintendent's advisory council can, can discuss that. Um, Danny will discuss that with Dr. Dyson, and the regs will be a different uh, section um, resource for us to use. The board sets policy, and then the superintendent sets regulation. So, our policies do not get into um, what's involved for staff. We just sort of create the umbrella, and then the superintendent, our legal counsel, and our superintendent's advisory counsel gets into um, the details of, of the rest of what needs to happen in our school system. Um, so, very well done, appreciate it. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, Liz has been working on this policy for, for um, since our last meeting, and ten thousand years ago. <laughs> ten thousand years ago, um, and you know she has a full time job, she has a family, so it wasn't done purposely to, to upload it on Friday. Or actually, sorry, she sent it on Friday, and I should have asked Catherine to put it on Friday. Got some emails about it and it got uploaded on Monday. So it wasn't done intentional to have it uploaded in a short amount of time. It's just that uh, this is work on policy and, and life, you know, just things happen. And nothing was done intentionally to get it uploaded on Monday. Um, and she did send it on Friday, and I should have asked for it to be uploaded on Friday, um, which was still one day after Thursday. Our Thursday um, uploading documents, but we've uploaded documents after the agenda has been put 
on line four, um, nothing on purpose. And um, even though it was uploaded late, you know, this isn't final reading, this isn't the final discussion, so there, there's still more time to discuss this policy at this time. Um, would you mind giving us your, your thought process? I mean, not here. Um, yeah, and I appreciate you making excuses for me. I value that. I, I do. No excuses. No, it did take a long time. And, um, it's a lot to think about. You know? Well, and there was three drafts, right? Yeah, one of the things that I did was I was thinking about so the racial equity committee delivered to us just a tremendous amount of work and research. And, and then I got the impression that when staff kind of just spelled that down to the last draft that staff showed us that there and I think I'm sorry that Mr. Mahone isn't here anymore because you know his point about are we making a statement, are we making a policy? And then your point, you know, where are the teeth, right? What are we how are we gonna because that's been the whole thing, right? So we know these racist incidents continue with the occur. We have students tell us things, staff report things, but we still talk, we've always said we're not going to do racism in SPS. So what's going to be different now? And so creating that actionable piece was was a big deal. Um, so I looked at other school systems, and Cincinnati, the school district in Cincinnati just went through this, uh, they went through this, and they created a very, what I would describe as an assertive anti-racism policy. And it's disappeared because there were, there were problems implementing it. And we as a board need to talk about the definition of the term anti-racism, because if we were to bring that to the full board, the board would both have a policy that is anti-racist. Like there is a specific definition there that would require everybody in the school system to take on an affirmative posture against <clears throat> racism. Not just a passive, I'm not going to be racist, but an affirmative like action every single day. And while I think that's that would be good, I think we would have some difficulty with it. And that is going to be a conversation that I'm sure we're going to get a million public comments about. And I welcome them because I'm confused by it. And so, to the point about my process, I went through and I took out the major sections of what everybody says should be a school district policy about this. And I tried to consolidate those into the action, the culture, the curriculum. And then um, I tried to include proposed ways we can measure progress, which has got to be reported. Now, staff have already started to put dashboards online with performance data. Um, I think we got an email the other day from uh, this is Yoho about, well, don't, um, I look at your policy, don't, you know, don't obligate the superintendent to report you things. I mean, those are all the decisions that need to come out. We would direct what needs to be reported and the superintendent would then implement procedures. So I was trying to get to actionable. Um, but I do think we're still in kind of like a, a policy statement versus something we can measure. Uh, I tried to I tried to look at multiple um, examples. I tried to I just didn't want the racial equity committee to feel like they were taking a half part out of the time because they did really good work. Um, I just felt like it needed to be tighter and a little bit organized more differently, and then we need to get the actual pieces. But I think training is one of the <laughs> easier items to discuss um, when we think about policy and regulations um, and then action. So, you know, we, we decide on a policy that we're going to have training. We want anti-racism training. 
and then how do how do we implement that? You know, that's, that shouldn't be up to us. That should be up to Dr. Harrison and Carrie and Equity Department about how we talk about or how they talk about how they're going to train their teachers in anti-racism and dealing with racist incidents. So when we start forming this policy, we should say we're going to have training. But that's not up to us how we do it. That's why we have staff. Staff develops our training for our teachers. And then we make that requirement for, for our staff. So, you know, when we think about the teeth, you know, that, that's what our staff is here for. And that's the difference between a policy and a rent. You know, we, we set it, we develop it, and then the staff takes it over and, and, and implement it. I think the struggle right now, and if I'm I think what I'm hearing from the University of Racial Equity Committee right now is that there is a difference between um, training that's um, like anti-racist in the you know the Kennedy kind of definition of that, right? Versus uh, cultural proficiency, anti-bias, uh, inclusion, sort of like diversity, equity, inclusion training 101. There's a difference in those two things, mm -hmm. and one requires a series of. So if we don't say if, if the if the majority or whatever says we want to have a we want our school system the board says it's a policy statement right we want the board and the school system to be anti-racist, okay. but then our policy doesn't say that, then staff would be directed to implement the same kind of trainings that they have to do, right? So the bias, the cultural proficiency, but not take it to the anti-racism sorts of training. And I think that's where we are with creating the policy. We, we haven't had an anti-racism policy before, so there was no anti-racism training. It was cultural proficiency. But this policy doesn't say anti-racism. I was so confused after our last meeting that I just said stopping racism. Yeah, which stinks probably. I, along these lines, I don't think the policy needs to state anti-racism policy to take an affirmative posture against racism, especially when coupled with the regular reporting. Um, yeah, this policy makes substantive changes toward equity in MCPS. I, I, I don't think it, we need the word anti-racism to structurally improve the system and outcomes for, for all of our students. Yeah, I think I raised my hand. They would argue that way or because yeah. I think how uh, the Tia uh, finished her statement is it's not even in our, it's not even in the title. We well, take it out of the title, so you know, right. we should add it back into the title. I thought I thought her comment was so interesting because she said, you know, how much words matter and how much they, how much weight they hold, and I agree. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that we have, in various forms, this board has tried to. Tried to say things. We have tried to have uh, statements that we put out, but then, you know, to me, like the meaning right now is going to be the implementation, and if that works. And but I also don't want to. I don't want to have a policy that doesn't seem strong. Right. You know? What was the point of Cincinnati? You said they had it and then they didn't. I feel it. It's really confusing. So Cincinnati went through this whole. Thing where um, you know, of course, the city is very involved in their government, so it's all kinds of political, you know, and it's a big city. But they, um, but they had a um, anti-racism policy, and um, they defined anti-racism. You know, they were it was very much like uh, on the heels of you know, saying Black Lives Matter. Um, and having that be like a, you know, a, a thing around the community. And um, there was, 
there were a number of challenges to it. And so, like, you can Google Cincinnati's anti-racism policy, because I did, I did the source, mm -hmm. and uh, it's no longer there. So, I don't know exactly what happened or what's happening, but it's like, page not fail. <laughs> um, and it was there when you started the research? No, I read about it. I read about their process because, so, I mean, my, my perspective is I want the, us to have reporting solutions because if we're able to track things, like, you know, this from when we talked about the hiring stuff, right? Like, I mean, there's so many liabilities here in terms of what we don't know and what we hear. So tracking, transparency, those things are super important. But if we have another policy that just says we're anti-racist, we don't do it, then it's just another performative, you know, waste of time. And so that's where I thought like, the board has, and you guys obviously have a perspective on what we're measuring in here, and then taking that to the full board to see if that's the right thing. And I think some of the board needs to be paid out. You know, like, what were you racism? Like, and then when I tried to define racism, you know, institutional racism, structural racism, I thought, okay, so what do we need to go with SEP? So then I just said, well, we're just going to define racism, not do the rest. Um, and I thought about you because you've talked about we can't fix all of the world's problems. Um, I thought the, the, the wording suggestions that uh, Mr. Cohen and others shared were ones that were um, one that I wanted to incorporate. Mm -hmm. I, I did, and I wrote down, I get, I wrote down those notes because obviously I want to see where you want me to go. If you want me to try to take the suggestions from your public comment, place them in red over um, Liz's draft, and then send it to the committee, make sure I captured it, and then we can use it for discussion at our next meeting. That's the next step you want me to take. Um, I'm wondering what's the quarterly reporting. Um, okay. I, I'm sure, yeah, you know, it's a start. You know, I, I don't know if, if quarterly is too often. Um, we will start with semi annual. So, um, I was thinking about if there's a way to consolidate. So we, we, we get reporting on uh, situation uh, straits, and we get reporting on um, some of the other like staffing issues, and then we get you know we get the um, the complaints to the, the ethics law hotline or whatever. Like I feel like that's it wouldn't need to be like a detailed thing. It would just be like so you can like, like numbers. Yeah, like, a chart. yeah, and then maybe have a school or theater. I think for two main reasons I support um, at least quarterly. Um, one is to me that's the teeth of the policy. That's how we ensure this is not performative, but that there are results to pass if we pass this policy. Um, the other thing is, I mean, it was it was a different um, it was a different administration, but there has been difficulty in getting data. When I was represent when I was the board's representative on the racial equity committee, the, the delays in, in getting data sometimes were long, and having a quarterly expectation in, in policy is important to me. Um, so I will put this kind of now in your policy format. Liz, you did a great job. I'll incorporate these changes. Now, typically, too, we have staff review it, give you comments like Dr. Harris has seen. Um, and we could do that as an addendum. We could fold those in. Because they'll know it relative to how do we train, what are some words that already are aligned with the work that we do. So do you want me to do that by way as a summary of um, suggestions or thoughts relative to that. I know certainly Dr. Harris is on, you know, the 
Because I don't know, I, I'm assuming you, you're working with them and, and things like that, but typically I will have that staff member help me review and come with them. So now I'm just looking for next steps and where you want me to go next. Kathy, um, good morning. Uh, I do work with the Racial Equity Committee and really helping them uh, through all of these different things. We are out of some of the comments um, that they've been making, some of the things that they've been working through relative to their draft of the um, policy um, that's presented here um, today. And so, you know, I'll continue to um, be part of the Racial Equity Committee to hear their feedback specifically from some of these things. So if it's um, the thought that you want me to gather their continued feedback and reactions from um, this draft that we have here, certainly I can do that. I think, um, under, I think under culture number four, the board directs the superintendent to gather data on student, gather data on student and staff perceptions, school-based culture, classes, including perceptions and experiences on race and racism, and to report those data quarterly with the racial equity committee. Um, Racial Equity Committee is our committee, so I, I think you know it should be through staff, um, such office appointed staff, and um, the liaisons rather than the superintendent. So change that order to. I just the only person we can do that. Well, what Carol wants to do your other policy is you're directing the superintendent to work with relevant staff to execute. Yeah. So. And I'll just make sure it's parallel with this, right? You that's the only one you can direct, but then some of your language indicates to work with staff and departments. But the um, I think the bigger issue is that would be useful to go through and pull out all the staff and the superintendent just look at the physical. There are definitely things. So we've got to find a way to repeat work for people, but also a way to make sure the information is in house on that order or whatever. And so I just want to make sure that you guys are taking action as well. So we're not adding work. I and that it makes sense to I, I appreciate this, man. Hearing the conversation, I can really tell, you know, it's an excuse this time. I can tell you really put a lot of thought into this. Mm -hmm. And I think the time would be well spent to get to this point here because you just can't put things down, but you, you really want to make this action oriented. You want to make it strong. You want to make it powerful and making sure that staff is proactive and aggressive in addressing some of the concerns that we've been hearing from the racial equity committee, from concerned citizens. And I think this does that. Um, I do believe that there are some consistencies and languages and clarifications that if staff are implementing these, that they would need this clarification. So we definitely can work not some of that piece. I would love I would love for us and I think for you know some of the performance achievement data dashboards that are that are on you know because really this comes back to the right? You take away the barrier of school achievement so if we connect those dashboards together so that we're putting this together and see what's I 
that in a way. I'm just, I feel like all this works.
um, he will work with his team and we'll work together in hopes of you know having this for the, the September policy committee so we can kind of keep it as that, that work in progress make sure it's posted and, and also too I think we reached out or somebody reached out directly to give it to the racial equity committee and so we can certainly do that even you know as we're working with I, I said I did not send it originally. They do have they have. The no. feedback was very positive. Yes. Appreciate the work. Are you pleased with the, with the I um I want I mean revisions uh coming to policy committee at the September meeting I did make sense and and it works directly work session yeah I do so. I I feel <laughs> I think I think there are there are substantive ways that our students will have better educational outcomes and better experience without CPS when we implement this policy and so yeah I I would like the right policy adopted as soon as we can in the school year to, to truly positively affect the school year. Yeah, the rest of the policy committee is open to this, the revisions come in the work session. I, I at, at the next work session. It, it, well, what's the deadline? <laughs> what's the deadline? Did you guys have like strong and appropriate deadlines? But I want to make sure we can meet that deadline for the next work session because I think it's this is this week. That's it. So are we no, they want to go to work session. So if we want to go to work session, what would be the deadline for the September 14th? Oh, I thought it would be September 8th, the Thursday before. We also make sure it was official. So do we need to? I think the September 24th work session September 28th. Or 28th would be would really give us the time to vet it have people look at it and like i said i think we got feedback as far as feeling that i have enough time so my recommendation would be the second work session especially because you're catapulting it right the work session we want to give our best work and Absolutely. give stakeholders <laughs> <laughs> we want to give um even stakeholder time as well I mean, I, I think that makes sense. I understand that my personal preference would be that we discuss this at the September 14th meeting. Well, and I also understand it very well may be at the September 28th work session. And I think um, if it's possible to go to the 14th, because we'll have a policy committee on the 28th. So if we, if we had a little go around with our friends, that and got some feedback, we could work on it after policy. Because you know they're going to send it back to us. I mean, I would bet you. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, no, you're saying it. I just thought it was just What do you think? I mean, the staff so needs more time. It has to be. What are they doing? Okay. I mean, you, have, you do policy committee update. And so you felt like you just want to give an update of what we did. What we did today, what's coming, that's still a notification. And I mean, we have like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just want it to be done well, so that it's sort of. I always, yeah. And I want it to be done well, and I want to have the time, and I want to stay for it. But so that you have people, you know, that you want to give that time to, then I think it's a better afternoon. I mean, I don't, I don't want to. Put it on the 14th and it's not ready and it gets posted on you know, the 12th. And it doesn't get out. And it didn't set the race record training center in the theme. That's a week and a half to be feedback. That's just, that's what. Like, for something do, is so big. I do yeah. think the key is, is right, posting on Thursday before, following it. And so, yeah, I, I don't know how to put it. I would love to see it ready for the eight. To me, this is this is close to being ready to go to work session. 
Um, and so I would love to see it posted on the 8th. I also recognize not, not posting the six days before uh, when we're bringing this to work session would, would not be good. And so if it's not ready for the 8th, I certainly understand waiting for the next work session later in September. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anything else you need from me? Yes, there are additional public comments. Oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. State your name, please. Jennifer Kearns, and uh, this isn't on any of the policy matters at hand. It's more a uh, process procedural issue. I understand this is public comment and not Q&A, so I'll state it as a comment, but we welcome any response you might have. I, Given our experience over the last couple of years and the success in virtual attendance at meetings, live streaming, et cetera, I think that uh, this committee's meetings and other committee's meetings ought to be live streamed so that parents don't have to make a decision about you know, whether they're going to use precious vacation time to come to Frederick when perhaps they might work somewhere else like DC and uh, use those uh, hours. Uh, if they will have, won't have to make a decision uh, between doing that uh, to have you know, an awareness of what's going on with their child's education um, or else preserving for other uses. Uh, so again, that's a um, simple comment and, um, and if you uh, could respond and offer any thoughts on that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. K-E-R-N-S? A, K-E-A-R-N. Very quickly, my name is Carol Antonowitz. Um, speaking for myself, very proud of you for working on this issue and just very happy with the work of the Racial Equity Committee, the community event that they held at Frederick High to get feedback was wonderful. And that could be one possible way that this gets implemented to have ongoing community opportunities for speak out. Uh, and I really appreciate that the policy will have some um, direct the superintendent to collect data and to get feedback. I want to say that you're going to, let's hope that we're going to expect that the number of reports will go up because I think that will tell you that what's being implemented is really happening. That teachers are feeling more and other staff are feeling more capable about dealing with individual incidents. But we should also look not just at the individual acts, but the overall institution. That's a little bit harder. It's like turning a battleship around. But I'm very hopeful about Frederick because now we have the county, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and the city, well, um, the Chamber of Commerce. So there's many things that give me hope. This is long overdue, um, but I really commend your efforts. So thank you. and. To me, the teach, training of teachers, I understand that our workforce is about 80% white females. Mm. <laughs> what do we need to learn? When I hear heartbreaking stories about how a white teacher with a little five-year-old who was scared went under the desk and she called the police because she was scared of a little black kid. Didn't happen here at Health Advanced Care. But it just tells you that we're so inundated in our society with who we should be afraid of who white people should be afraid of, we need to help our, our white teachers, particularly and staff, learn more, do better. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to share a public comment? Thank you very much. With that, we are adjourned.